I know it's going to be a very exciting evening. My name is Jane Potter, and I am the president of Meadow City Conservation Coalition. We are a volunteer group of citizens of Ward 3 who care a lot about the meadows and the history of the meadows, the integrity of the meadows, the future of the meadows. We're working with the city to hold conservation restrictions on parcels of land, mostly in Ward 3. Um, we are very happy to sponsor educational outreach, and we're delighted tonight to welcome a speaker that will talk to us all about the, the levees. Um, I wanted just to let you know that we welcome new members, and if anyone would like to join us, please see Mac, who has membership forms. Um, everyone is welcome. And I would now like to turn this over to Fred Zimnock, who will introduce you to our speaker. Thank you very much. Looks very nice. Um, thanks for coming. I'd like to uh, do a little history and an introduction uh, of our speaker. Uh, the hardship of the Great Depression was increased by the flood of March 1936. Heavy winter snows up north in early thaw and later torrential rains created a huge flood causing great damage and left among scattered detri detritus a huge wall of weighty onions on Main Street in Springfield. Then in 1938, after a steady rain of four inches, a Category 3 hurricane ran up the Connecticut River Valley, causing still further damage and a loss of almost 100 people. Recall that there was in those days little predictive ability with the National Weather Service. They relied on reports from ocean-going vessels to know what was happening in the ocean. Both these events were pretty much a surprise for the area and produced damage <coughs> of biblical proportions. After these calamitous events, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers built our levees on the Mill River and the Meadows, along with a stormwater pumping station that will pump stormwater out of the low area of the city and beyond the levee into the Connecticut River. Today, on almost any sunny day, a visit to the levee in the Meadows will show strollers enjoying a level walk on the levee and the view of Mount Holyoke Range. I grew up in Westfield, which has the Westfield River uh, coursing through the northern section of the city, and it is also protected by a much longer levee that is also a nice strolling path. Still other levees exist along the Connecticut River in Hadley, Springfield, Willamance, and elsewhere. Now we have a rare opportunity to learn about the details of these important passive protective barriers that will become more important as climate change produces warmer water temperatures in the Atlantic Ocean and strengthens hurricanes running up the coast. Our speaker <coughs> is Scott Michalek from the United States Army Corps of Engineers. He is the branch chief of water resources for New England working in the geotechnical engineering section. Using Wiki, I learned that geotechnical engineering <laughs> share it with you, is a branch of civil engineering that studies the behavior of materials using the principles of soil and rock mechanics and subsurface conditions of materials to design and evaluate earthen structures. Think levees, or if you were in the military, think revetments. Uh, there are also some brochures up here. I think he's got about 25. There should be enough for everybody if you want to understand levees in more detail and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Using this knowledge, he serves as dam safety officer in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. He's been at it for over 13 years throughout New England and the Northeast. He graduated cum laude from UMass Department of Civil Engineering and continued there to complete his graduate work. He will take questions after the talk. Since he, spent, since he spent some time here in the valley, you can ask questions using your normal local vocabulary. <laughs> 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 and I hope, I, I hope you can tell us what a toe drain is. Oh yeah, that will be in Thank some you. of the presentations today. <laughs> tell us about it. Thank you. Also with me tonight is Mike Bashan, he's my program manager for the levee systems um, throughout New England. 
just quick, we have about 61 levee systems that span from Stanford Hurricane Barrier in Connecticut all the way to Fort Kent, which is the tip top of Maine. Um, so we have 61 systems and 32 flood control dams. So when it rains, we get quite busy. Um, go ahead, Mike. Uh, quick things, USACE, I'm gonna, USACE is the acronym for U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Military, we like acronyms, so um, bear with me on that. I will try to explain acronyms before I'll use them. But USACE is the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. I'll describe briefly the program, the history, and its mission. Um, pretty much, levee safety program came about after Katrina, um, after a congressional request. Um, I'll go over some of the general overview of the levee systems. In particular, more concentrated on Northamptons, because that's the levee of interest. Um, I'll also talk about our inspection programs, some of the common deficiencies that we find in the levee systems and also some of the challenges in operating, maintaining, and balancing priorities of levy systems with development and other, other areas of that nature. Levy safety program mission is to assess the integrity, and this is right out of the Corps' levy safety program. Its mission is to assess the integrity and viability of levies, recommend actions to assure that the levy systems do not present unacceptable risk to public safety first and foremost. Okay, public safety in the course program is paramount above all else, whether it be environmental or whether it be development, public safety is first and foremost because the value of a life cannot be estimated. Um, and then also protect property and the environment is the, the two secondaries to that. Um, again, for public safety paramount, reduce imp uh, economic impacts by building the systems. Uh, maximize the cost effectiveness of building those systems, develop reliable and accurate information, that's through the inspection program and, and working with the, the communities, NED, for example, um, plus building public trust and acceptance. After Katrina, the Corps took a beating in regards to media releases and everything else. However, hopefully, you know, working with NED and stuff, he understands that the locals have a lot of responsibility involved with operating and maintaining the systems that we built for the community. Um, so going, going back a little bit in history, Northampton, when we built the Northampton system, the city agreed under assurances, which is basically the contract with the United States, that we will build it, no charge to the city of Northampton. They will provide all lands, easements, rights away that were necessary. We build it and we turn it over for operation and maintenance by the city in perpetuity or until Congress deauthorizes the project, whichever comes first. So if you guys don't want the project, you can petition Congress and they can take it out. <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen, but I'm just saying that that is, that it hasn't happened yet across the country. So, next slide. Um, global context, nationally. Number and location of levees in the U.S. is currently unknown. Um, we know our inventory, we know other federal levy systems, but I will tell you right now, Hadley does not show up on my inventory. Hatfield does not show up on my inventory. Hatfield and Hadley do not show up in the National Levy Database. I only know about them because I've dealt with problems through providing technical assistance through the State Emergency Management Agency, but those were built as agricultural levies decades before. So, just so you put it in context, some of the national levy systems, you know, across the country, there's a lot that aren't recognized, and I'll go in a little bit further detail on that. Um, they're abundant and integral to the, the infrastructure and the economic development of many communities, looking up and down the Connecticut River. West Springfield used to be a lot of farm, now it's all housing behind the levy system. Same, same, same thing on the Chicopee side, and to a certain extent, same thing in Northampton. Northampton's grown tremendously since the 36 and 38 floods. Flood risk management, which is the overarching program that we fall under, involves a plethora of strategies and techniques and tools. Some of it is floodplain management, some of it is zoning bylaws at our local levels. Some of it's the National Flood Insurance Program and, and the insurance offsets and stuff of that nature. It's not just that structure that's sitting out there. It's also community involvement and awareness and outreach and, and all that. Um, however, 
nationally, everybody says, well, that levy's there, and I can go develop anything I want behind it. Well, <laughs> yeah, that's the primary tool, but it's not the only thing. That's... All right, when I said don't know the condition of most of the nation's levies, there's 14 million people that live behind 22,500 kilometers of levy system in this country. Kind of a large number when you come down to it. Why are you using kilometers? <laughs> we flip-flop, sorry. <laughs> sorry. I, this, this presentation came out of something that was on a, a national conference. That's why. So you had Canada, you had the Netherlands, you had others involved. So we used kilometers. We converted everything. I should have converted it for the slide. I didn't have time, so um, bear with me. <laughs> Um, so, 2,500 kilometers of core, just core levees that we've built and constructed. Some of them we maintain, others we don't. Um, others are locally operated and maintained. It's about 40,000 miles. Um, at a glance, the federally owned and operated core levees are 3,220 yeah. kilometers, roughly. Not a whole lot in the grand scheme of stuff. Um, federally constructed, locally operated, which is similar to Northampton's, is 17,429 kilometers. Um, local levies enrolled in Rehabilitation Inspection Program, which is the Corps' Public Law 8499. Had they wanted to be accepted into it, I would not accept them in because, one, they don't do maintenance to it. Two, they can't tell me how it was constructed or how it was built to show me the engineering behind it. Um, to do that, they would have had to do an assessment and then we would accept them in once they've done the assessment and brought it up to the standards, similar to what you guys maintain your levy system at. Um, that's basically a program and a quick overview of RIP. If your system becomes damaged by Irene or Sandy or any, any other storm event, we go in 100% federal dollars and do whatever corrective action needs to be done to that levy system at no cost to the city. So, indirectly, operating and maintaining it and keeping it in an active status with us, we go back and, with federal monies and go and rehab that system. Right now, we're rehabbing a couple of the beaches in Connecticut um, that provide shore protection. They're actually a back berm. They're similar to a levee system, not quite the same, but they're a back berm and they provide level protection. There's two in Connecticut, Prospect and Woodmont beaches, which are closer down towards Milford and Stamford area. And then the Squamish gets in nationally right now, but that's in Rhode Island. So there are some federal beaches. Would you say it one more time? If we keep the maintenance up to date, yep. then... If there's damages from a, a significant storm event, it cannot be because of lack of maintenance. So if there was damages due to lack of maintenance, like we're not cleaning the tow drain system, we're not doing this, we're not doing... It could fall back on the city has to do the repairs. Right. But for all intents and purposes, Say a section of the Mill River levee system or flood wall caves in over by the power treatment facility at Smith College. Okay. We come in, we reconstruct it at zero cost to you guys. Can you explain these differences again? Which on on these? Yeah. 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 I can't <laughs> read that. Sorry. <laughs> Federally constructed, locally operated is the red. That means that it's similar to Northampton system. We came in, we built it, we turned it over to the locals to operate and maintain. Up here, there's a small sliver that's called federally owned and operated. That's ones that we built, we currently maintain and operate. Okay, there's some that are all in the Mississippi and the tributaries that we own and operate. It doesn't get turned over to a local sponsor to operate. Then there's these other ones that are enrolled in the rehabilitation inspection program, like I said, mm -hmm. Hadley or Hatfield could potentially be in that if they did maintenance and actually had the engineering drawings to go along with it. That would be something similar to that. We didn't build them. I don't know who did. I believe it was the state at one point, way back in the early 1900s. But, and then other federal levies would be USDA might have some levy systems as you move out into the Midwest. I don't think there's any in, actually there is one. There's one in West Hartford, Connecticut that the USDA constructed. That would be an other federal levy system that we know about in the inventory that another federal agency constructed or built. Bureau of um, uh, Interior De Department of, yeah, <coughs> Bureau of Recreation. That would be one, Reclamation would be one that they would have constructed, but typically they're west of the Mississippi, they're not in the eastern seaboard. The other remainder of the pie 
is 160,934, roughly, this is all estimated, kilometers of levee system we know nothing of. So nationally, it's a pretty big issue. And, and that's where Hadley and Hadfield are now. We're they're falling in here. here. Mm -hmm. I know about them, but they're not in the, the federal inventory as of yet. How about the ones in Wilmette? Wilmette, Chicopee? Yeah. Those were federally constructed after the 36, 38 floods. And the one in Westfield? Westfield is state dike. I don't know if that's in the national inventory. That was the state constructed that dike. The Corps did do a design in Westfield, never wanted to buy in and go into it, but we won't go into that. <laughs> <laughs> we had a whole levy system designed for Westfield, just like we do for Northampton, Chicopee, Springfield, West Springfield, Hartford, East Hartford, but they never wanted to sign on the bottom line, so we never built it. And those were all done at roughly the same time, I presume? Yes. Yeah. Most of the Connecticut River was done after the 36-38 flood events. The oldest system I have in our inventory is Haverhill, Ma uh, Haverhill Mass which was a significant flood wall along the Merrimack uh, oh, River. Mm -hmm. It was built in 37. It, well, it was started in 37, completed in 38. It was one of the first ones after the 36 that, that completed. That's the oldest one. Mm -hmm. And then all you guys up and down the Connecticut are the next, next group. And then after the 55, more eastern mass in eastern Connecticut got some going on. This will give you another perspective of the universe of levees. That pie chart says it one, one way. This area represents all levees in the country. Um, this is the level of protection or the, the event that it's designed to. This is the, the, the categories. This is federal operation and maintained. There's not, not a scale to this bottom one, but this is federally operated and maintained. That's one we built and we operate. The next one is we built local maintains. That's similar to Northamptons and up and down the Connecticut. Next one is the RIP, and then the others is all the locals that we have no clue about. Um, this is in our inventory and assess in our assessments. Regardless of the level of protection, whether it could be below a hundred year or one percent annual chance exceedance. I have some up in Lincoln, New Hampshire. It's about a seventy year chance exceedance. It falls down in here. You know what? We're still responsible for it. We still make sure it's operated and maintained because it still provides economic benefits to the community. Um, so internal to the youth, to the Corps inventory, any of these we still inspect routinely on a yearly basis. Up here is the National Flood Insurance Program, which is FEMA. This is, this is anything that's a hundred year level or higher. That's really where FEMA starts to get involved. Again, I'll t at the end I'll talk about the 100 year level, but um, anything above that line provides significant level of protection, flood insurance, and, and, and all that, so it's not within the, it's a shaded zone X is what I think the new term is, but anything there and above falls into the FEMA realm. So FEMA does know about ones that do provide a level of protection higher than the 1% annual chance. This box down here is the, the big unknown, and that's that's the one, again, like I said, out of the 160,000, we don't even have a clue on what this number is down here. All right, thank you. That's for all of the NFIP only. This is both the core and FEMA, and we do work collaboratively. Um, and then and that's the next nexus that we're trying to, to solve. All right, forward. <laughs> oh, there's your miles. 2,100 miles we own and operate, 9,650 miles we built and turned over, and there's 2,250 miles that are in our program that we didn't necessarily build, but they, they still get uh, inspected routinely. There's a plot of all the federal ones, USACE ones. This is the 14,000 miles identified in our USACE program on the map. Highly concentrated in the Northeast, along the Mississippi, Upper Northwest and California Valley was sporadic in other areas. Path of the program, like I said, pre-2005, yeah, we did quasi-semi-annual inspections. Some of our people and our operations staff at the dams would come out and inspect Northampton. Joe Fellow ready. Yeah. Um, 
they come out with different criteria. There was different criteria for federal levies versus non-federal levies. In other words, the ones that we built had a certain criteria, and the ones that were accepted into RIP had a different criteria. There was ins inconsistent application across districts and regions on how individuals expected and rated and all that type of stuff. Um, 100 year, you know, 100 year levies, and there was no risk communication to the public in regards to the levies. <clears throat> Post Katrina, as I said, that was a major um, turning point. FY06 had supplemental monies in Congress, and that's when we started to do the inventory, and then we started to do a more rigorous inspection program. So a couple of check marks and stuff like that has now turned into what, Ned, about a half inch thick inspection report. So it's a little bit more rigorous. Engineers actually do the inspections, not biologists or our field folks, which might be foresters and stuff, or natural resource specialists. It's typical engineers, Mike, myself is geotechs, civil, structurals, if there's flood walls involved, mechanicals at pump stations and stuff are involved. So we try to do a thorough inspection with engineers, not necessarily just other sciences that don't necessarily have the, the proper training. And then, now we're moving into levy assessments and risk assessments, which starts to bring <coughs> risk involved and, and starts to prioritize nationally your levy system versus one that might be in Davis, California, versus one that might be in New Mexico on a national level, and it starts putting risk numbers and loss of life and where it falls. It, it's called a FN chart, which is you can elaborate on it later if there's questions on it, but we're going more towards a risk-based approach on how we assess it from an economic and a, a life loss standpoint. Next. Um, context of the levy, some truths. Although proven beneficial in investment and functions, levies have inadvertently increased the risk to public safety because we have developed more behind them and developed in the floodplains behind them. Um, Levies only reduce the risk to individuals and structures behind them. They never fully eliminate the risk. That levy in Connecticut River Valley, we could have an event next week, two weeks, three weeks from now, where that system could get overtopped by whatever comes down the Connecticut River. Even with our dams, even without our dams. Mother Nature is Mother Nature. Um, or up the river, as in the case of the hurricane in 30 or up the, Yeah, or up the river. <laughs> <laughs> um, government officials, general public, have only limited understanding of levies and risks associated with them. That was true pre Katrina. Um, the more and more stuff is in the media, the more and more we do presentations like this, the more and more you all become aware of what's sitting in your backyard. Um, so there is benefit to that. Many levies were originally constructed without the benefit of modern engineering techniques. They provide only limited protection to the communities. A lot of the agricultural levees were just side cast dredging adjacent to the river. Take the bucket, excavate it, throw it up on the river, and it just kept getting built and built. No engineering behind that, guys. No compaction, no earthwork, no, you know, um, some of those. Some of them were hydraulically filled levees. A lot of the Mississippi is hydraulically filled. That is an engineering methodology. However, it's not necessarily the best methodology. What does that mean? Hydraulically dredge means you, s uh, with a dredge, you suck up the, the water in the, the soil from the river to enlarge the channel or deepen it or whatever. You take it, you pump it out, and basically the water, the, the, the soil settle out, and the water just des uh, dries off or is decanted off, and basically you're building up that way. Sort of like sluicing or, or something of that nature. I know we're talking about astronomical rainfalls and so on, and that the levees may not be what they should be, but let's not sell the levee short. No, I'm not. It, no. Yours is a 500 year so, level of protection, so 0.2% annual chance of exceeding. Yeah, but since the levees were built, mm -hmm. there were many, many improvements that oh, yeah. happened above us. Oh, yeah. There's a lot the of dams. The of the water. But the understand, there's a lot of dams that were built upstream that are part of the whole integral watershed right. protection, not just the levee protection. Yeah. So your levee height may be based upon having five dams upstream. Yeah. All right, maybe we build seven. All right, so yeah. But your the, the system in Northampton was designed 
230,000 CFS coming down to Connecticut, which that's cubic foot per second. That's a lot of water. Um, 20,000 coming out of Newark simultaneously. So. And, and unlike what Scott was talking about, the levy systems were engineered. You'll see later in the presentation the cross section. Yeah, I'll, just side I'll go into detail. Right? Yeah, we, we didn't side cast right Yeah, right. Nope. Um, uh, agricultural fields and now our large urban developments. West Springfield's a good example. Um, a levy system, this is crucial to understand this. You have a project. Chicopee has a project. It was all built under the same authority, under the same monies. That's good to a certain extent. However, when you have levies that this might all have been built under the same congressional authorization or built under the same project with the same design and specs. However, this is one system here that protects this green town in Riversburg. This is one system. It would be two segments because there's two, two individual people that are responsible for operation and maintenance. Over here at Metroville, one city, yet there's two, two systems internal to that city. So a system protects a particular, collectively provides protection, reduces the probability to a defined area up to a specific event. So there was a big discussion, even internal to the core, on whether Mill River provided separate level of protection than the Connecticut River. And we, we've been arguing this internal to the core with our people at the risk management center and stuff of that nature. They finally have come to, to see that it is one, truly one system. Because of the old Mill River, there is an interconnected channel between the two systems. But it, it is, it was almost going to be two, I believe the reports are written as two separate systems, if I'm not mistaken. They were two separate systems, now I think they're going back to one system. It, it still will be two. Oh, it, it, Just it, because of the pumps. Okay. Because it, it's based on consequence area and whether the Connecticut's high or low and Mill River's high, it, you know, it, it's all on hydrology and watershed and, and, and that type of stuff. Mill River tip, typically pr protects downtown Northampton from stuff coming from Mill River. Connecticut protects downtown Northampton coming from the Connecticut. So it is sort of kind of two systems, however, the consequence areas overlap when you start looking at elevations and stuff. Next, um, our inspection program. We have routine inspections, verifies that the operation and maintenance is being done. There are more rigorous standards than what they were previously. Um, improved communication. We talk a lot with Ned and we tell him what we're up to. Our staff goes with his staff. It, it's an integral inspection. Um, it's system based and it's every year. Um, in the past, it might not have been done every year. It might have been every year and a half, every two. Um, periodic inspections, verifies the proper O&M, evaluates the structure of stability, compares constructive criteria to current criteria. This is where the design, our engineering standards change as we learn more. Um, here's where we, we assess every five, every five years, it could be every 10 years, they're re-looking at that, um, but we reassess What's changed? Has anything changed? Is it is it worthwhile to look at stability of the bike system right now? Um, we also do screening level risk assessments, um, periodic routine inspections, performance and consequence analysis. When I talk about two consequence areas in Northampton overlapping, there are two separate economic consequence areas to the, the two, the, the Mill River and the Connecticut River. Um, so there are two separate consequence areas. That's where we start to get into that. That's going to be analyzed to be determined. Right now we're doing it, it might be every 10 years, we reassess it, um, or after a significant event or significant damages, it may be reassessed again. Um, currently there is no policy as of yet on what that is. And then risk assessments is very down in the weeds. You start ass assigning loss of life values, you start doing um, probability and failure modes on what the system can do, where do we think there's potential failure modes, and then you start to get into event trees and all that type of stuff. And it's a very, very rigorous and very costly analysis to get involved in. All right, going into some of the inspection stuff. Um, excavation structures or other obstructions present within the project easement area are generally prohibited. All of these in this figure are 
unacceptable encroachments onto the levee system. Deck system and garden built into the levee system. How did they do it? Did they cut in? Did they take the impervious? Did they tie into the tow drain? Did they cut the tow drain? Did they cut the storm drain? How does the water get to the pump station? This one, huge stockpile of material on the land side of the levee system. Okay, did you guys crush the tow drains? Did you crush the storm drains? Fencing, access during flood fighting is crucial um, so that Ned's people and the DPW can get free access up and down on the interior side of that levee system, and I'll show you why in a few minutes. So all of these are, uh, look, yeah. all of these are unacceptable. What's the Utility poles That's what I thought. penetrates right through the impervious layer because this is on the outside of the levee system. This is the river here. This is the protected side over here. This is on the outside of the levee system. That penetrates right through the impervious core of that levee. What about trees? And we'll get there too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mother Nature. Grass or sod cover is one of the most effective and economical means of protecting flood control levees. As you guys very well know, walk in yours. It's got a lot of grass growth. Um, it protects against erosion caused by rain runoff, channel flows, and wave water. Um, there are levees in the Mississippi, Kansas, and out of those areas that have been tested, tried and true, with vegetation cover, particularly sod, where the water's just flowing over them when they get overtopped. And you know what? There's no erosion of those levee systems. The water just rises on the interior side, and everything comes up. Some areas do get some damages, but again, we go back and repair them free of charge. Um, but sod has been the best performing on, on levy, sod and rip are the best performing means of protecting the levee system from erosion. However, all of these are unacceptable. Here, you can't get in there to see whether there's animals burrowing through your impervious blanket. You can't get in there to see whether there's scour or any erosion. You can't get in there to see what other things might be going on. Is there a desiccation or a cracking of the clay layers? Is there, you know, you can't get in there to see any of that. That's bad. This, everything's over, it's probably about this high. I can't get in there. I can't see where the animal might even be, let alone getting in there to see if he's dug into the impervious or not. Um, this one, you got encroachments of vegetation on both sides of the levee. And I'll show pictures on why in a few. But again, this is higher grass. This is an encroachment because tree roots, and I'll tell you right now, cottonwoods are notorious for it. They will find their way to water, regardless of whether it's up and over the levee, through the levee, or down and underneath the levee and all. Um, they will find their way to water. Um, typically, trees greater than two inches in diameter, diameter encroaching on the structure pose stability and seepage issues. Uh, so a tree that's two inches in diameter can start having roots that start penetrating into tow drains and penetrating through impervious barriers. Um, so it is crucial to, you know, maintain the levee system as it was originally put into service, which means no vegetation on it except for sod cover, and it's supposed to be mowed between what, Ned? <laughs> Six and eight inches? So it's pretty much right there. Um, next. Is this acceptable, minimally acceptable, or unacceptable? You guys tell me. <laughs> That's unacceptable. You know where that is? Pomeroy <laughs> Terrace right down here. This one is shortly, probably about 3,000 feet downstream, down levee from Pomeroy Terrace, and it's a tree on top of the crest. Oh, yeah. That's and this is Pomeroy Terrace when you go through the canopy of the U's. Both of those are unacceptable, guys. I thought so. <laughs> so who's at fault for that? I won't mention it again. <laughs> the old guy, you know, he used to maintain it. I bet you those U's were a lot smaller at one point in time. But you've been inspecting them every year. Yeah. But you've been inspecting them yes. periodically. Yes. And how many times in my report since we've inspected them since 2005 it said remove all vegetation from the groins of the levee system and along with those. Every single time that since Joe Falretti even probably if I go back to some of the older inspection reports, vegetation has always been an issue. 
regardless of whether it's Northampton, Chicopee, Springfield, West Springfield, or any other of the ones in New England, typically it's all vegetation related. How far back do you have to keep the vegetation at the bottom? Do we want to know? 15 feet. What's your easement limits? They vary. They vary. Typically it's 15 foot minimum. Minimum. 25 is better. You know why? Because they can get the tractor through there and keep the vegetation down, keep the weedy growth down, keep the woody growth down, and also maintain that sod cover so you don't erode the toe of your levee system when, the, when and if the water comes to the, the toe of the levee. Riverside or landside. Plus, it, and I'll show you why in a few minutes on another reason when you start getting into flood fighting. Next. Sorry, is it that picture? Can you go back to that yep. picture? That's Pomeroy Terrace. That's right Pomeroy Terrace the right, the right there. But what about on the left? Right there is about 3,000 foot walking down the levee towards Hockenham. Hockenham, sorry. Hockenham. That, yeah, that tree is on the levee crest. So the one on the right is behind Pomeroy? This yeah. is Pomeroy. So the trees that, that are behind my town farm there or whatever, there's that. I don't know where town farm is, sorry. It's, it's further down. No, that's, that's the next segment of the tree. The trees right at where it comes out. Yeah. I'll get into some more pictures in North Hampton. I was just bringing, I threw those two in to ask whether it was acceptable, minimally acceptable, or unacceptable. How about the path? Huh? How about the path? How about the path? The path on the Northampton Viking system actually was a gravel path for maintenance. Um, the path itself probably should be regraded, which we've, we've said a few times. Um, just to keep the crest up so the crest elevation doesn't ro erode away, it should probably be built up as more of a, a path or a crushed stone, or we've talked about stone dust in the past, um, just to keep the level, level of the crest up. Um, is it an imminent threat? If I had to prioritize increasing the crest and, and putting crushed stone down or taking out the vegetation, you know where I would go? Vegetation. vegetation. <laughs> <laughs> um, Right here, this is out in, towards the Midwest. This is all roots going up the riverside of that slope from these trees that are right here. This is them trying to ring a sand boil around a tree that's on the riverside of a levee system, or on the land side of a levee system. What does that mean? Um, I'll get into sand boils. It means upheaval. It, it means, actually, Materials are coming out of the levee system and coming up onto the land side. And the only way that you can stop that immediately is to start putting sandbags around the boil to bring up the water level, and it stops the fines from, from coming this way. It, it, it's actually the head pressure of the water actually stops the fines from moving. And if not stopped, they could... If that. not stopped, I can show, I'll show a picture of something else. And this is on the land side of a levee, and it's in a small forest. So when, when I say 15 is minimum, the levee is over here. Yeah. It's down here on the picture. That's probably a good 25, 30 feet away. So 15 is minimum. Would 25 be better? Yeah, probably. 30 be better? Yeah. Depends. But I'm not going to sit here and say clear 50 foot on the toe of every single levee system. It's all relative to, you know, land and easements and other stuff. On dams, I'll tell you right now, on our dams, it's at least 50 foot upstream and downstream toes of a dam. Preferably. Hmm? This? Yeah. This was in the Mississippi River Valley. Okay. But don't say it can't happen here. Because it could. And I'll show you pictures on why. Next. Um, look, that one. Sorry. Here's another one. Um, this levee has been breached, but you can see trees on this side have gone straight through the levee system and caused the failure. Because the water finds a path of least resistance and goes right along, right along the root systems. So, again. Where is that? Danube Dyke, I believe it's also in Mississippi. It's in, it's in the, the central part of the U.S. What about a, uh, a tree, be, tree in, the, in the levee in a storm, 60 miles Overthrows? Away. Yep. Overthrows, pull out part of the levee. Mm -hmm. That happens too. I don't have any of those pictures. I could have put those pictures in. I have plenty of pictures. Mike's seen them. 
Yeah. There's plenty of pictures of those too, where you can start overthrowing trees, and that starts an erosion path, and the, just the rains and the, the stormwater themselves, you start getting nine inches, ten inches of rain. You start causing erosion rills. It starts compounding itself and can worsen the situation. Next, um, this is actually a dam. In this is New Delhi Dam. It's in um, Missouri. This is the dam spillway. It has breached this way. And this is all the trees and the vegetation growth over there. Now, this is only only because you all know where West Street is and Route 5 and your street closures and stuff. This picture was taken in 2007. This is in Missouri when the Kansas City, uh, uh, the rivers up there flooded. This is the railroad closure structure. Here's the river on this side. That same river is on this side and it's going over the closure structure. It's done. It's met its design. Can't stop it anymore. Yeah. But this is, and that's a pretty decent sized closure. It's probably no different than the, the railroad closure road out this way. That photo shows you the intensity of the rain storm. Mm -hmm. Well, and this is on the, this is probably on the Missouri River. Um, they get a, they had a lot of snowfall and snow melt back in that 2007 time frame. Um, the, the issue there is a little bit different than here. Their rivers stay up a, a lot longer than ours do. Mm -hmm. Connecticut stays up long, but theirs stay up months yeah. as opposed to a couple of weeks. But that just shows you in context, you know, it can happen. When you say a railroad closure, what does that mean? Back one way. Right here. Yeah. This is the rail line that goes through, probably over a bridge, okay. which is probably well inundated by now. Yeah. But these are all stop logs that keep, get keyed in, okay. similar to the way West Street yeah. keys yeah. in, Thank and you. stop logs go in between. Closed. It's basically, it's a breach through the system that has to get closed during the storm. Yeah. Doesn't Pleasant Street also have something like that? Pleasant Street, yes. No. Yeah, yes. Route 5. Route 5, yes. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Route 5, yes. West Street, yes. <laughs> uh, West Street is a Route 66. 66, yes. <laughs> Next. Flood walls. Um, you have short span of flood walls. You do have them over by Smith College, over by the power facility, and then you also have them down here by the pump station. These trees, both sides, are unacceptable. Um, one, the overthrow issue that you were talking about, you start removing soil from the, the, the heel side of a flood wall. So the flood wall's here, this side stabilizes the flood wall with the weight that's on it. You start removing some of that, that wall could start to tilt. You could start to get movement of the wall, which then can cause, in turn, can start causing separation of joints, which in turn then causes flood waters to start coming. Would it be acceptable just to cut those trees down? Or do you have to uh, you should them? remove all roots. Within reason. Now, technically, it's supposed to be all roots within a half inch diameter of the root mass. Am I going to ask Ned to go out there and start measuring every root? No. You want majority of the root structure removed from the from the, um, but the system. But generally, the roots don't extend past the branches. Generally, unless it's a cottonwood. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then you can still get some branches like this, uh, some roots like that going to bad branches. But then practically, where we have all those cubes, yep. that means rebuilding that part of the diet. It removes cutting down the tree, excavating the stumpage, backfilling it with an acceptable material, and regrading it and sodding it over. Yes, it does. So just cutting it down wouldn't. Because what happens with the roots? Yeah. They decay. Then you still have the pipe sitting there, ready to go. Right. So you actually have to uh, remove it, excavate it, yes. backfill it with uh, select material or some more material, and move on. Avoid. Again, both unacceptable. Uh, also, there's probably toe drains on the interior side. Roots clog toe drains. Next. Again, ruts and depressions are problems. They allow water to pond on the crest or access road. Uncovered water seeps into the system and can start causing erosion rills and tension and every, uh, begin to cause uh, failure during a flood. It also be becomes a low spot or preferential spot for uh, drainage. Plus, as I said, crest height can reduce over time. Again, 
if your levee system was, you know, a more common occurring flood, like a 1% chance, not a 0.2% chance, okay, this, is, this becomes probably just as important as removing vegetation. But, priority-wise, vegetation first, then you start working with the press. Because you can always sandbag the press out of the flood event or bring in material to increase the press rate. Not that you want to, but you can expedite some of that. Next. Burrows and levees. Uh, again, huge issue. Um, gophers, muskrats, possums, badgers, other animals such as fox um, that steal other uh, burrows can lead to rapid, rapid levee failures. Again, for what I said, they excavate through that impervious layer and then they're into the core of the system and it can start causing damages. Active animal abatement programs are required to remove these animals. Um, sometimes you have to consult with your conservation commission or your fish and game or your state agencies. Um, if you need contact, let me know. Um, Recommended to determine which rodent control procedures are allowable or recommended. If you live below the Mason Dixon line, sometimes the 22 works. Um, <laughs> you still got to go backfill the barrel, though. Um, and I say that in jest, but it, it is true. Uh, ironically, there's no burrow holes by the firing range at the Hartford Police Department. It's, it's adjacent to the levy system. Don't know why. <laughs> um, this is Hartford right here, repairing the burrows. To repair a burrow, you actually have to excavate the burrow in its entirety to make sure that you're not keeping a, a hole sitting internal to the system. Um, they had to backfill a bunch of them. Typically, wood chucks and stuff are not as, they don't penetrate as deeply into the system. They're usually just superficial holes, um, but you still got to track them. They're not like prairie dogs. There was a levee system failure in Nevada because of prairie dog holes. They went in post-flood post dropping down. They grouted all the holes, and then they sort of kind of washed the le le levee away, and it looked like something from Blue Man Group <laughs> with all the pipes. Um, but that's... that's that's the prairie dogs as opposed to the like a woodchuck. But they do have their burrows and they do have their tunnels too. Well, if you've got a woodchuck, you've got a problem because they have seven or eight openings. Yes, they do. And they build a and network connect, of tunnels yeah, on they connect. So they could really but I'm just saying, them. prairie dogs are much worse than the woodchucks yeah, are. Right, yeah. Prairie dogs are really but going on. Flat gates, you guys got a bunch of them. Um, need to be inspected, lubricated at least once a year typically before flood season, so that you make sure they're operational. Um, gates aren't seated properly. Water will back flow through the system and can come up through Mill River by the pump station or other areas. Um, they're basically a backwater preventer. Uh, this channel is a little too tight for that, for that flat gate. Um, plus there's debris that can come in or get clogged. This one isn't even cleaned out. You can't even yeah. open that one, let alone back water in. Plus, the seal doesn't seal right. I have a question about this. Yep. Um, we have the Williams Street North line that goes out to the Mill River, and huh? it just um, it, it goes under the dike at one point, and it. Do I get call a friend on this? Because <laughs> I don't know this this okay. part of the dike, but okay, well it does. Okay, and then it just empties into the river, and there's no gate at all on it. What is that the kind of thing that we shouldn't right. be doing? Uh, it should have a flat gate on it potentially, <laughs> but I don't know. Oh, is it, if, if it has a gate, okay. It's a street box with a gate valve. It still has a valve. Okay, there you go. That's why I'm calling a friend. These guys know it better than I know it. Or they should know it better than I know it. You can shut it up. Yeah. So they have an in, they got a valve. Instead of having this, they have a pipe like this, and there's a valve that sits in the middle of it, and they can close it. These are typically at the pumps. At the pump stations or at large discharge points. Yeah. But at a lot of the pipelines that you're talking about on the interior side, usually they'll have some type of valve that they can turn and close a gate yeah. and then actually close it. Actually, here on Pomeroy is actually a structure with a gate that close off the sewer. Oh, but, but that's on the river side, so it that's closes it. the flow before it gets into the system. That's yeah. right. That's yeah. what I was going to say. It's on yeah. the river side. Right. Yep. It's on the 
the river side of the system. So they close the gate before it gets. So if we're flooded up to the dike, yeah, and that and that gate better be closed. Closed. <laughs> how, how do you get to it? Yeah. They go off the boat. <laughs> there you go. Let's go off the boat. boat. Or they go off the boat. Somebody should go out to a manhole. Oh, really? Go down with a key, stand on top of it, and close it. Yep. If it's flooded over. Yep. I, I've never seen it flooded over. Right. And it's plus, easy. on the Connecticut, you have adequate time to make sure stuff is closed off. Yeah. It's um, closed off way before it could get flooded over. Okay. Yeah. Next. Let's pick it up a little bit. Drainage stitches, swales. As you can see, I can't really see that culvert. Uh, this looks like it's all been sedimented in. This one looks pretty good. Again, drainage, Mill River Channel, as much as it's a habitat, there's still siltation in that, and that was a solid hand-placed riprap channel. It was, it's better than concrete, but it's a solid hand-placed riprap channel, so if there's siltation in it, you're not getting the 20,000 CFS that can go through that system. Yep. But again, it's, you know, some of that pump stations need to be inspected annually. We require mega testing, which is an electrical resistance test to make sure all circuits are working, um, especially critical power circuits. Um, nuts. Yours, yours are diesel. One diesel, two gas, one Yeah, pump. right, which is, which is better than having electrical pumps. Electrical pumps, one, cost a lot of money to run, two, you're dependent upon the electrical power. So if you have a hurricane, guess what, guys? You yeah, better have a backup power supply for the electrical <laughs> pump station. Um, it, diesel or gas or propane, typically, because you you don't rely on the power grid. Yeah. And what do we have? You guys have uh, diesel, uh, gas, and pr propane now, because you guys are Western. Western, so. All right. There's your system. Uh, Connecticut River Dyke system is over here. No river dike system is over here, and there's your flowage to the oxbow, and then out into the Connecticut. Again, that's another picture of it. Um, there's Northampton under the 36th flood. There's where your dike system is today on the Connecticut side. Pretty much all downtown, all up in the uh, Route 5 bowling alley, that whole area. Pearl Street. Yep, underwater. Part of me. Next. There's Main Street. Yeah. yeah. Next. Got to clean the catch. I believe this is the Mill River. I believe that's the power facility, but I'm not talking. What road is that? I don't know exactly. It's in our old photographs, but it is. What's the day on the picture? It's back at 30. It's going to be 36. It's 36. Where is this? I don't know. Oh, you don't know? There's more damn than that on the bottom. Yeah. Yeah, but they don't know the exact location. Yeah, I don't know. I'm a, it's got a power facility, so it could be along Mill River. <coughs> oh, that could be the Smith College it could uh, be. power plant? could be the power plant. Mm, yeah. uh, oh, okay. Because it looks like this is a roadway or a rail bridge here. So that could be the Smith, <coughs> Smith College. That power could power. be, and that could be the, the, okay. the railroad come up from New Haven. Yeah. All right. Your dike system here in Northampton. <coughs> Over here you have pervious material, meaning sands or gravels, random transition section, which is probably more gravels or sands, and over here you have your imper impervious blanket material, which is on the order of, it's on the order of about five foot thick. Mm -hmm. On the, this is on the river side, this is on the land side. Your top crest is about 10 foot, 12 foot in some areas, so this is your impervious side that I was talking about. So you get a tree sitting over here at the toe. You know, those roots are into into this random transition zone, potentially. It's clay? Yep, yeah, typically it's clay. Clays are, or, <coughs> or tills. Out here it's going to be clays, because you're yeah. in the Connecticut River Valley. How thick did you say that one? I believe it's five foot in most sections. Um, it, it varies based upon elevation and height, because it's a one on two slope. Mm -hmm. So the section that's, what is it, like 100 yards of just big stone, the whole on the river side? The riprap, the hand place riprap. Is that yeah. I can get into that in a minute, but that's that's usually on the bends. And if you go go back a couple, you know, without knowing the system all that well, uh, no, back to the picture. Back. Too far. Yeah. Right here. Oh. Oh. 
I guarantee you it's right in here. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Because Connecticut River flows this way, and that is a preferential path for the Connecticut River under floods. So that riprap is protecting that corner of that structure. Riprap is going to protect better than sod will because it'll protect from velocities and flows. That is a jut out point in the system. Now with the highway there, it's probably less of a jut out point, but dur during original construction, that's all protected because that's, that's where the velocities are going to be the highest. And the scour, the back scour coming into the system under a flood. Several sections of riprap on it. Yep. Yep. And then there's some that the, the whole channel is here. Down, down the Mill River, it's a yeah. lot of it. You know, Smith the whole channel. The Smith, Smith, Smith down yeah. Yeah. All the way down to the bridge. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's all riprap line. Is, is the um, highway itself riprap? I don't believe it is. No. The I-91? I don't think I-91 no. no. has any riprap on it. I don't think so. But it still provides a buffer for you. Mm -hmm. So. And each, each year, we have a contract where we spray the riprap to mm -hmm. keep down the road. Keep down the vegetation road. Next. Oh, back. All right, so you've got that on this side. You've got the, the sod cover and the slope. Over here, you have a rock tow drain. I believe most of yours are rock tow drains with some pipe, no, it's pipe. some laterals. Yeah. It's, yeah. Um, so there's some rock tow drains. Some of them have uh, probably a bit of pipe, pipe, pipe as collectors. Um, and that's the tow drain. That's the pressure relief system for water that's coming into the system. Next. So Again, that runs typical runs, section. That tow drain runs the length of the dike, the lead levee? Uh, a lot of it does, and it runs down to the pump station, and that collects the water that's coming through the levee system naturally, uh, just like groundwater flows naturally. It comes through the levee system, that's the point of interception, and then it runs down to the pump station and gets pumped back out into the river. And I've never seen water in there. Bet you in 87 there was. <laughs> oh, that's a good thing. Yeah. yeah it is a good thing. It can also be. All right. At one time, we found all of So this is a typical composite overview of the dike, similar to yours. Hand placed rip wrap, selected impervious material, free draining river sands typically in the middle, uh, or transition material, which could be gravels and, and clays. Um, <coughs> vegetative cover, rock tow drain, drainage ditches, some kind of, I don't think you guys have too many, but, but there's, next, next. So this is seepage overview. The river comes up, next. Starts infiltrating through the impervious layer. It stays up for an extended period of time. Then you get the natural surf water surface that wants to firm, form through the levee system. And then the waters are flowing through this area. The tow drain collects that water or the, the ditch. Actually, you guys have all drains. Takes it, pumps it down to, takes it, flows down to the pump station and discharges out. That's your interior pressure relief for your system. Do you Next. know that that perimeter drain is clear? That's a good question. <coughs> what are some of the other things in my inspection report? Have they been camera inspected? Are they clean? Have they been clean? Are there any breaks? Are there any collapses? And if there are, those need to be repaired. So. No, I don't know whether they're free and clear. <laughs> it's on Ned's list of things to do. <laughs> I think you guys have done some of them. No, not yet. Zero budget. Okay. Well, I'm not trying, I'm not, he knows I'm not trying to throw him under the bus, but the more you guys can help him with his budget, the more he can get into getting the system built and responsible. So, next. Potential issues with this, trees, roots, animal burrows, like I said, through the impervious layers. Other issues are the top of the crest access roads, the toes of the slopes aren't clear so that you don't have free clearing or, or roadways that you can get up and down the levee system for, to patrol and inspect. Other issues are obstructed drainage and seepage flows. Are the pipes free and clear? I don't know. Um, sediment blocked around lateral drains and all that type of stuff. Next. Um, effects of having some of the deficiencies, you have faster infiltration rates through your system, you get more water inside your dike system, you get sand boils that start to happen. Next, you get outbreaks, where there's seepage outbreaks internal to the dike. 
which you'll see coming over the, the land side toe of the system. If you start seeing water coming up on the land side toe, that's not necessarily a good thing. If it's clear, it's, it's not bad. It's not good, it's not bad. If you, you start seeing materials, like it's flowing, like it's cloudy, then that's a problem waiting to happen, or it's already started to happen. Um, this one, I can go quickly through this one. Um, this is a, a, a bench scale test that was done at Rich, Rick Waterstadt, which is in the Netherlands. It's at Del Pares University in the Netherlands. It's a full-scale load test of a levee system. That's seepage coming through a levee system. There is no toe drainage. This was a full-scale test that was done to better understand what's going on internal to the levee system. Um, as you move forward, it's piping material. You can see it's still piping material. It's coming out quicker and quicker. And all that material, well, I went too far. Yeah. Too far, too quick. Tension cracks start to build up internal to the system where the water's coming through. That means that there's a pipe starting to form where the water's coming out through the levee system. And that pipe's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. You're starting to lose the crest elevation because everything's starting to collapse on itself. Um, again, if you had water one foot from the top of the levee like Fort Kent did and you had started to have this problem, and not much you're going to do, guys. It's, kind of like it's coming in. Did we in 1874? Um, you can see the tension <laughs> cracks that run all the way up. And you can see how much material is coming through the system and just piping through. This gives you a better feeling for the seepage. Yeah. So you guys would fix this one for free? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then it starts to breach. Now, understand this is a controlled test, so there's only so much water on this side. If it was the Connecticut River and the water was still up here, this would all be gone. Um, it would look similar to that dam photo I showed you with the vegetation next to the spillway where it was pretty much gone. So seepage, clear seepage, not a bad problem. Seepage that starts conveying material, real bad. And sometimes the hardest thing to know, and sometimes you have to watch your discharge waters coming out of your pump station and stuff, because if he's sucking the water through those pipes, he might not see it. Because the river's cloudy and the pumps going into the river are cloudy. Sometimes it's, it's visual observation. If you're walking the, the levee system, for example, and you happen to see a seep that starts to show fines coming up through, or you see what looks like looks like mole holes or, or vegetation hole, but it looks like all the same uniform size sand, that could be a potential problem. Well, part, of, part of the operation manual on this, when it gets to a certain elevation, You're supposed to be walking it. they walk the ducks yeah. and they look for those kinds of things. Yep. Yep. Now, this is a system that's pretty close by, less than 30 miles away. This is their lateral drains that come out of their tow drains and go to their ditches. You think much is flowing through. <laughs> Next. Think much is flowing through that lateral <coughs> drain into the ditch. That's almost five foot of sediment that's built up since it was constructed. Here is it replaced. They replaced lateral tide into the drainage swale, conveyed to the pump stations. They cleared out all their swales. That was Hartford. They spent over $9 million doing maintenance to their systems. Clearing vegetation, and your system is nowhere near the same size, but I'm just, it's close by. It's right there. They spent a lot of money to get stuff back, and ironically, they lost their city engineer. He retired, and they haven't done a whole hell of a lot to keep it up. So they're, they're slipping too. This is in West Springfield after the 1938 flood. After the West Springfield, this is down by the Big East. This is sand boils. These are all sand boils. There's over, there's something like over, I think there was over 2,000 sand boils that were located around the Big East at the old horse track. So, 
it is something that's real. Um, it is real for your system too, and I'll, it, it, if you look, you have the Oxbow. So you guys have sand lenses and stuff like that that come in and out of the system, from, just from a natural state underneath it. So it is, it is possible to occur. North by Northampton pumping station inside. This is the discharge line. There's the three pumps that discharge out. This is the, the buttress flood wall on either side of the pump station. Here's your railroad closure here, about the same size. Here's your five closure or Pleasant Street. Um, again, vegetation on this side, vegetation on this side, vegetation on this side. Um, there's your riprap protection going along that corner. Um, again, closure. Vegetation near the pump station, vegetation on the outside bend near the pump station. Pretty decent section right here, I believe, is an observation riser for the tow drains. Ironically, that's where the vegetation is. Um, again, you've got some vegetation encroachments over here. It depends upon your easement limits. I don't know what they are. Um, over here, you've got broader riprap, free flowing channel. Over here is broader riprap. This is adjacent to the pump station. This is the intake pond for the, the pump station, uh, trash rack and stuff that goes in. Uh, open them road, both sides. Again, pretty well maintained. You've got some overhang of some trees. Um, the other issue with overhangs is you can't necessarily get equipment in there. You can delimit pretty quick. But you you really can't get equipment. If you needed to get an excavator or a dump truck in or something like that, it, it'd be hard pressed to get in there to, to do yeah. sand boils and stuff. So I'm just throwing out the points that we looked at when we do an inspection. Um, Smith College Dyke um, here, we got Northampton Dyke again, riprap again. Hand place riprap, you will not find many other places than up in the northeast or in the, the northeast region. It was WPA days and it was very labor intensive, but you know what? I would take hand place riprap over any other place today because the long side of the stone goes into the dike system. So you let vegetation then crouch upon it and grow into it, you know, it, it's pretty historic in nature because it was all hand placed by hand. Our, our, um, our engines that drive the uh, water out. Yep, the Sterlings, they're, they're cooled by town water. Yeah. Is that a problem? No. They have a cooling mechanism to them. They probably actually have pipes that tie into the pump chamber, too. Mm -hmm. so, so you're not you're not liable to lose town water unless in a flood pressure. I don't know your system well enough to tell you whether you would lose town water or not. There is river water sitting right there too if you absolutely direly need to control, you know, pull off your engines. Um, I know Tom Hamill Chickabee just did some bypasses such that he could take in some of the water um, in, in an emergency situation. So he's still there. Yep. Yep. He had retired that like some people. <laughs> <laughs> This picture, yes it is, I took it. I was here when you guys closed that. I was with my wife, it was supposed to be a getaway weekend. My in-laws were watching the kids during Irene. I came down and we actually ate dinner, I believe at Spoleto's, and we were staying over at the Ivory Creek bed and breakfast over at Athlete. Went to go down West Street just to see what the system looked like before the storm, and ironically I can't go anywhere on West Street. I get out and I start taking pictures because I'm an engineer. My wife goes, well, you get back in the car. Um, <laughs> again, they know how to close their st structure. You, you exercise your closures at least annually. The railroad, that's a unique situation. Um, again, you're much higher up if it was the railroad closure. West Street tends to be your lowest closure. Um, that's the one that gets exercised the most. Kudos to the DPW for practicing. There's a, some towns that don't practice. And we ding them on it. Because technically you should know where all those parts to assemble that is. Yeah, I've never had river elevation, but we had a float railroad. Right. Or roof. Right. 
Landside Mill River. Um, these pictures are a little bit older. I believe you guys have removed all the vegetation adjacent to them. We're working on a contract right now that's ready to go to the yep. Okay. I know that it's been cleaned up some. Uh, north, this is Smith College side. Trees are starting to get pretty close. Um, I, you know, whether you limb them, get in there, it might be more beneficial for mowing. I don't know. Um, right. This is diversion channel. This is some of the sediment build up that we were talking about immediately downstream. Yeah. Um, again, overall, the, the dike systems are in pretty decent shape. There's some areas that have vegetation issues, and the tow drains need to be inspected. But overall, the systems are in pretty good shape. The channel, the Mill River Diversion Channel, I have never, and I deal with a lot of national stuff, I have yet to see a hand place riprap channel anywhere else in the country. You get concrete, you get other stuff, but you guys get a very unique system there. It's actually very impressive when you walk it. I know. I sit on the Conservation Commission. It's not right. It, it, it's, it's habit that good. It is still pretty nice. <laughs> and it should be maintained. Here's the drop down structure underneath the South Street Bridge. Um, this prevents backflow from the Oxbow going up into Mill River. This is about a 10 foot drop here. And there's a deep pool here. I'm sure it's pretty good fishing. Um, there is, <laughs> but um, that's that's pretty much the end into the into the Mill River. Then it goes into the diversion conduit. Um, again, vegetation on the Mill River side. This is as you get around the bend. There's some vegetation issues over here. There's to rock toe drain over here that I can't seem to find out where it is. So. Again, diversion channel. I know you guys have prepared that because the Conservation Commission had to call our regulatory office and you know what? It was categorically exempt from any federal permits because it's maintenance to a federally constructed system. Where's that? It was the to replace the, the riprap over on the Mill River Diversion where the kids have stacked it and made a, a walkway across. Uh -huh. The Conservation Commission for the city of Northampton called our regulatory who immediately calls me because you're they're doing work on a federal project, a federal levy system. Regulatory issues a permit goes, you're categorically exempt, you're maintaining a federal project. So sometimes it's good um, to have the backing. Um, these trees are probably pushing limits on, on getting underneath the brick wrap. Um, would I touch them right now? That's top of bank there. You start touching them, you start destroying the hand place rip wrap. I that's a that's a hard call. Would you cut them? I mean, you don't want them to get bigger. If they overthrow, you're going to be replacing it anyway. I don't know. I don't know what bikes are taking it is either. It, it's that's a hard call. That's a diversion channel. It's four channelization. The top of the bank is almost right there. Um, Technically, under policy, I would say, yeah, they have to go. Do I want to cause a detriment to the, the riprap that's underlying it? Because you're never going to put it back the way it was originally put in. You mean that's a checks and balances. If you, if you get rid of the roots. Yeah, you'd have to excavate the roots. But what about just cutting the tree? Uh, you're still going to start getting this with the riprap. You're going to still, <coughs> still start, start to get deterioration. Sometimes, you know, I don't know. I don't know what you're <laughs> You may be better off just cutting the trees and then watching. Just watching it. Well, right. That's what I would think you would yeah. want to do. But again, like I said, that's not a priority. The levy vegetation is more of a priority than that channel vegetation. Mm. <clears throat> but again, you know, the kids have done some of it for you. <laughs> levy safety, sound technical practices to the design, construction, operation, assessment, security, and maintenance of the system. Um, effective public education and awareness of the risks involved with levies. Um, we have a joint task force with the Flood Risk Management Program with FEMA, um, National Association of Floodplain Managers, Association of Floodplain Managers. So the Corps nationally gets involved in a lot of stuff from the headquarters level for outreach with the other agencies that deal with floods. Um, competent safety programs for existing levies that emphasize the protection of human life. Um, 
feasible government solutions at all levels of government, local, <coughs> state, federal, as well as community boards um, that encourage and sustain effective safety programs. In other words, effectively are maintaining and protecting what was built for the, the investment in that community. 1% event, as I said before, is not a safety standard. It's an insurance actuarial standard that was established under FEMA for flood insurance. They had to draw the elevation someplace. It happened to be the 1% or 100 year level. They had to draw the line someplace for flood insurance. For you guys, it could have been 500 years. It would have been great. Um, for the Mississippi, that wouldn't have been too good because all theirs would have been overtopped and they'd all be fine for flood insurance. So it's an actuarial standard. It is not a safety standard. When, when, and when you go through the NFIP accreditation process, I would recommend that you put the water surface on top of that levee system and find out where your crucial areas are. Because raising the water surface when you're doing an analysis for stability or seepage doesn't cost much more. But if you raise the levee, if you put it only at the 100 year, you're not truly assessing the true risk of that system. Because your water can go a lot higher in that levee system than just that 100 year elevation. So that's why I'm saying it's not a safety standard. It's only an actuarial standard. Now, FEMA will say all you have to do is certify and credit <coughs> your elevation. Okay. And you get an engineer to sit there and stamp it. All right, good. You met the NFIP, but when we come back in a couple of years and go, where's your level? Where's, we start looking at failure modes and potential failure modes. Where's your critical <coughs> section? You could have had it already done for cheap money. Um, and truly know where your risk of breach was, or your risk of getting inundated, or a risk of where seepage potential could be. Um, then that prioritizes capital improvements. And nationally, there, Congress and the poor and stuff are trying to look at it. Remember, the program's only been around since 2006, so it's still in its infancy. They're still looking at ways of trying to fund repairs and rehabilitation and that type of stuff in the system. Because when we designed it, it was the 36 standard. 2006 or 2013. Can you go that last five minutes? <laughs> no, that's fine. 1% chance of event is yeah. a 1% chance of occurrence in any given year. If I had a bag of marbles and there was, there was 99 white marbles and one red marble, the probability or the chance, you shake up that bag and if you draw that red marble, guess what? Your system's over. You know, you hit the 1% annual chance of exceeding. If your system was designed to that 100-year level, you're overtopped. Your downtown's flooded. All right, you put that back in the bag, and three weeks from now, you have another storm event. You shake up the bag. If you draw that red one again, you get another 1% chance. It doesn't mean that it's a one chance in every 100 years. It's 1% one one percent chance for every event that occurs. And what you said something about the five months. The 0.2% chance, yeah. so I would need a lot more marbles in the bag, and then you'd have that one red marble out of 500. But our system is a 500. It's pretty. It, it, no. it could be. It no. could be even above a 500 year. I don't know what the. Well, the river hydraulics and hydrology have changed since 1936. I don't know what it is. It's pretty. Close. It's pretty close to it though. Pretty close to a 500. 500. Pretty close. The, the, the hydraulics haven't been updated, but just based off of what Springfield and Hart and, and, and Hart it, and stuff. It's a quote, roughly equivalent to a 500. But what we yeah. have to do is study what could come down that river since. And you don't have to worry about it. FEMA <laughs> has to worry about it. Well, I hope FEMA has to worry about it. <laughs> can, I, can I ask? In yep. lay terms. Yep. I'm trying are to do we, it as in lay terms as possible. <laughs> are the Ward 3. Uh, levees, which are down off Hockenham Road and yep. all the way to the Coogeman, are are we are they in relatively good shape, and are we relatively well protected by having those? They're levees? minimally acceptable. I I don't know. Um, I could say that the system should perform as intended. Okay. Um, if you have a 1936 flood event, I don't necessarily 
think I would say that unless I knew how the tow trucks were operating. Well, the 1936 flood occurred before 91, which ate a huge amount of flood storage capacity mm -hmm. down there. So there's a difference in the, yep. you know, the terrain. Well, I understand. Down there. Plus, 91 actually acts as a, another yeah, dike system. Yeah, yeah. Through. Well, there's holes through it. Yeah, but yes. I guarantee you he has a gravel pit someplace. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can fill some of those holes. I'm just saying, a lot of the hydraulics have changed, but if you had the same event without 91 there and everything else, the tow drains, I don't know. Should they? Yeah. Do I have confidence? I've, I've popped some of the manholes with some of the staff. Do I have confidence? I don't see sediment in some of the, the laterals that tie in over by Pomeroy and those. I have some confidence level that says, yeah, it should perform as intended. The top of the night is what, 132? I'd have to go look it up to tell you the truth. I think at the highest level we've ever had. You think I can remember 61 levy system with <laughs> the top of the dike is or every single one? The highest level we've ever had here was 120.9. Which was probably close to the 87 and 89. Yeah. Yeah. So. But it's, the 1% isn't comparable to other industry standards. The, for example, the shuttle or space shuttle or stuff like that. There's like one in 1,000 chance, you know. It, you get into some real tight constraints. Um, unintentionally encouraged by the NFIP in, in view of community affordability post WERDA. WERDA is Water Resources Development Act of 1986. Post development, a lot of development behind levee systems now. Uh, Natomas in California, which is right in Sacramento, multi million dollar homes are sitting behind a levee system that's not certifiable. <laughs> So, um, safety standards are well based in well developed engineering practices and tolerable risks. Yes? How is the 1% uh, level actually calculated? What do they take into account? Uh, I'm a geotechnical engineer, not a hydraulic I know about it only because it relates to the levee mm -hmm. systems. They have to look at the, the watershed and the elevations and the flood elevations. Um, and it must be based on experience. Some of it is. It's based on the hydrographs of the river and the responses and all that type of stuff. And now the period of record is a lot greater than what it was back in 36. So they do reassess. That's why I'm saying it could be more than a 500 year just based upon the period of record that we have for the gauging station. They, they look at the statistical um, going back from all the storms and then they then calculate uh -huh. what that percent chance is. Well, what what water surface elevation correlates to that 1% chance. Mm -hmm. Like Fort Kent, Maine was almost overtop. We, did, we built that from Fort Kent back in the early 70s. It was almost overtop. It was designed as a 1% chance elevation, roughly. Actually, we designed to a flow, we don't design to an elevation. We designed to a flow that can be carried by the river. Um, yours is designed to like 230,000 for the Connecticut River and 20,000 we designed to a flow, not to an elevation. So we, that flow equates to a certain elevation, uh -huh. but then we add free board on top of it and other stuff. That stuff. Yes. Yeah, I'm wondering about the construction that's going on uh, well, as we speak, but actually down by the clarion. Okay. It, those are all outside the dike. Mm -hmm. And there's more development going on, and as I read in the Gazette recently, there's, they got their eye on further development down there. It seems I, to me that I think is outside the system, is it not? It's outside. It's outside. Yes, it is. It's, it's in the actual south, floodplain. It's it's south of yeah. uh, the dike I mean, on Guess what? They're buying flood insurance. I absolutely. And they should be. Where they get it? Yeah. I don't know. They actually but have a pretty big system. Compensatory start. Huh? Yeah, I was on. I'm on the conservation commission. Take it out. And that's guys. It's to tell you I thought so. This one percent level is the hundred-year flood. It's a there. You can look at these FEMA maps. Anywhere that you see that a FEMA map showing that one hundred-year flood or the one percent is actually then a regulatory um, area that the Conservation Commission has to oversee. So anything that's built in that area is land subject to flooding, and you have to deal with the compensatory storage. The Clarion Hotel came before us. And they had to make sure that every elevation that they took up with flood storage was taken out. If you go down there, there's a huge set of, of um, 
pits, basically, that the water will fit into the tension ponds that take that add the flood storage for every amount that's taken and away. Technically, because I sit on Sterling's <laughs> Sterling Mass Conservation, technically you have to keep the hundred year event in your detention pond on your site for development now under the Mass State Stormwater Rights. Mm -hmm. So technically they're supposed to be keeping the hundred year on their site and in, in, into the infiltration phase. So it shouldn't, that's how they get around some of the compensatory storage. When you get the permit, did you include a maintenance, a yearly maintenance review? Yep, yep. There's a whole set of, yeah. Of all right. Ongoing maintenance. Can I just finish quick and then I can get yeah, the questions? Yeah. So, challenges. It's not just about the Corps of Engineers. It's also about shared responsibilities with the community, with the outreach groups, with the, the locals. Um, it's not just about engineering, it's about multiple business lines. It's about your local government, your conservation commission, um, your bylaws, your zoning laws, your flood insurance programs be in the NFIP. I don't know if Northampton is, I'm presuming they are in the yeah. NFIP. There's certain criteria as part of floodplain management there. Not just about constrained funding, like I said, it's about prioritization of that constrained funding. I'd rather see the trees and the vegetation cleared before the crest is raised. And the, you know, it, it's about prioritization of what's truly more critical than other stuff. Um, and then it's not about business as usual. It's transparent and open to Ned can call me or Mike or anybody in the core and ask any question and hopefully get a rapid response to the answer. Uh, now, So, we see you at Tundra before the three that she's first. Please first, then back in the Oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Technically, both. Um, Toad Ranch should be scampered every five years. Because they're that important, right? that important of a component to that system. Um, trees and maintenance, five years, you get some sumac growth. Yeah, okay, is it major? Could be, but toe drains are, are buried and out of sight, out of mind. Yeah. Yes? I wanted to go off of a slightly different direction. Is the, are the principles for construction of an earthen dam similar to those for an earthen dike, or are there other? Um, aspects that you have to take into account because the dam is constantly under pressure. There are certain things. A levee system or a dike system um, is usually under short duration of loading. Right. A dam is usually under long term loadings. Typically, with dams, you're going to get down to bedrock or put a deeper cutoff trench to stop seepage. <coughs> you might put, um, if, if you excavate down to bedrock in some of our dams, uh, Littleville and Knightville, you get dental concrete or you get a trench cut into the bedrock so that things are keyed in. Dams are a little bit different in that regard because you really don't want anything trying to save those out. Because from a catastrophic level, yeah, a levee, Northampton levee failing is catastrophic onto itself. But Fall Mountain Dam, I don't know if you guys know of any of our dams, the Fall Mountain Dam, which is about 400 foot high, that catastrophic failure is a little bit worse. Um, we so, experienced that in this area, if you know your history. What? May 16th, 1874, yeah. a dam in Williamsburg, which was not adequately built, it was built very much like your levees, yeah. didn't get down to bedrock. Just go to had a, had a Beaver Dam breached and took out a portion of 67, what, seven days ago? Oh, I didn't know. Yeah, yeah. see, even more recent. <laughs> well, I didn't see it in the paper. Yeah. And the dams are also designed so that they're not overtopped, but that the water, they have spillways that will um, discharge Correct. them in a controlled right. manner. Plus, the dam spillways are our dam spillways, not necessarily the mill dams and stuff, but the Coors flood control dams are designed to a probable maximum flood. Well, this dam now, is probable yeah. maximum flood means yeah. if it starts raining for 40 days, no, I'm, no I'm not going to go into that, but <laughs> no, 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 no. typically it's, it's a very, very extreme event. It's like the one in 5,000 year event that our spillways are supposed to be designed for. So the dam is supposed to be able to withstand a water surface elevation up to like the 5,000 year event. So it's... Would, would the earthen dam have an impervious layer? Yes, our, most of our dams have impervious cores to them, or cut off walls 
or something similar that stops the penetration of water through the mm -hmm. system. Similar to your levee system has the impervious on the slope. Yes. Um, I understand the hydraulics have changed around our dikes, or our levees, uh, but aside from that, has the core found any justification for the popular notion that storms are becoming more extreme? Is there any statistical support for that idea? As of yet, I don't think they're, they're, we're looking at it, we're trying to assess it, because the periods are getting tighter and tighter, mm -hmm. and the, you're still getting the same rainfall events. <clears throat> That's happened over the past couple of, you know, within the past five to ten years. Um, however, you can look back at the 38, 36 and say, okay, we've had 50 years of nothing that's been similar. Um, you go up into Vermont and you watch Irene, and I stood next to West Halifax, Vermont, which is the emergency evacuation route for Yankee Road, which means that road had to get rebuilt pretty damn quick. And I'm looking from the riverbed up at the top of the roadway that's up there, and it's all washed out. And you go, that wall of water must have been huge. Um, yeah. <laughs> so it's all anecdotal at this point. But it's still anecdotal. Yeah. I think there are some areas that that certainly is true, but then other areas they maybe get less. So mm -hmm. it's yeah, you know it's nationally it, it's sort of averaging itself. Um, but again, I don't know. You got to look at the period of record in relation to other periods of record. But you look at 38, you had 36 hurricane, you had 38, 36 flood, 38 hurricane, then you had some in the 50s, then we just had Sandy and Irene. You know, the return, you know, the period of, is pretty spaced. Um, I don't know. I, you know, if I had a magic ball, I'd tell you. But, <laughs> yes, sir. Would the dike uh, have been overtopped in 36 or 38 with the flow in the river <coughs> those years? No. We designed it based upon the 36 and 38 flows plus incorporated freeboard into it. Mm -hmm. So, no. How many safety margins would you have over the 36 and 38 built into a bridge? I don't know what it says in the design memorandum. I think it's freeboard. So it would have been So about maintenance, I'm thinking of the Mill River levee splitting system. Is that the city's responsibility still? It's all a municipality because mm -hmm. it's on Smith College mm -hmm. property. Uh, so is it for, I mean, how is, how is that property? Yeah. Yeah. It's, and I, it's part of it because I'm on the Conservation Commission. There's a lot of stuff going on around that area yeah. all the time. They're always, always, always maintaining their property, which impacts both yep. the levee system and as well as resources. Mm -hmm. So, but that's all municipality. The yeah, yeah. Has to I, I'd have to ask what the flood control easements that were acquired were. And technically, nobody's supposed to build on those without our approval. No, no excavation, construction, encroachments, modifications, or anything should occur to that levy system unless it comes through our office through real estate. It has to go through a real estate because we've got to check the, the easements and the rights away and make sure nobody's obtaining anything that shouldn't be obtained. Secondly, we always make sure that there's no adverse impacts. I put a stop to a four and a half billion E development in Stamford, Connecticut, because they were going to potentially adversely impact the hurricane barrier that was in Stamford. So I'll stand up for pretty much anybody. Um, but the thing is, is ultimately they were making it better, but how they were going about it was piecemeal. And no, it's all. I want to see everything down simultaneously. If they ever redid Route 5, for example, um, the DPW, uh, excuse me, the Department of Transportation guy up in uh, Northampton up here and myself. Al Stegman, you Yeah, mean? Al and I get along real well, not. Um, <laughs> just to let you know. Um, okay. Route 5 down in West Springfield and all that type of stuff, we're trying to, we're still trying to acquire drawings for West Springfield and stuff to better understand what they did to Route 5 when they constructed it. Um, <laughs> hey, stuff doesn't go unnoticed. It takes us a while to catch up sometimes, but, but no, I'm just saying, seriously, if you see somebody building on something or digging into the levee system or putting in a utility through the levee system or going over it or near the tow drain system or anything, 
let Ned know so he can call us. He'll probably put a stop to it quicker than we will, but again, we really need to know what's going on in the club. You guys let me find? I can call the Department of Justice and have people thrown in jail. Really? I can't levy fines. That's good. I think they can. They can. They can. Yes. DOJ can. I That's can. right. Yeah. And our legal well, counsel. <laughs> <laughs> um, technically, I haven't ever seen it done, but typically, when you've got the federal government that's chasing after your tail, usually you stop doing what you're doing. Usually. And if it comes, push comes to shove, I will go to our legal counsel and I will call DOJ. Yes, sir. You said something that since about 2004, 2005, you've been downgrading us to levy system in terms of its... I haven't downgraded you. It's just that the engineers have done the inspections and looked at it from an engineering approach, not necessarily a... Even the guys that do our dams, you know, we... And I'm not going to lie to you. We have entertainment problems at our dams because our... Guys are natural resource people. Trees are good, right? Well, yeah, to a certain extent, but they're not necessarily good on the dam or on the levee system. Is there a point in which you say too much time has gone by? Oh, yeah. What's it say in the letters? 2014? Yep. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> he knows the date. Ned knows the date. <laughs> it's 24, uh, September 2014? Or? Uh, January. January 2014, and then I move you to inactive. And then that means I don't pay for any repairs you guys do. Oh. Does it mean anything else? That's uh, it means that FEMA can come in and remap you as not providing flood protection. In other words, you all go into the 100 year. Because you're not doing, under FEMA, under the NFIP requirements, you are supposed to maintain and operate the system. Because another federal entity comes in and says, you are not doing what you're supposed to be doing, FEMA can, can choose to remap you as being in the 100-year floodplain. So then I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, this is, this is coming at me. When was, what, what, do, do, you know, do you know when the last time you said it's minimally acceptable now? Yep. You know when the last time it was at a higher rate, was it acceptable? Not since the news. Yeah, I was going to say since no. uh, It was, back then, they rated it differently. That's why I said. 2005. Yeah, back, back then, there was different ratings for different things. We went to a three rating system. It's either acceptable, minimally acceptable, or unacceptable. And trust me, if you get too many unacceptables, your system goes to unacceptable, too. Because it's the the least common denominator uh, that, drives, that drives what, rating. Different categories? Yeah. If there's something that's critical, such as tow drains yep. that aren't being re repaired or replaced, as the levy safety officer under Mike's recommendation, sometimes I can move a system to inactive um, because of this, this immediate threat. So it's been minimally acceptable for Since a we've been inspecting it. Long time. Yes. All right, nothing's changed. Um, not typically. Typically, it's always been vegetation issues. So, now can I ask my question? Yep, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a follow up, that's why I wanted to. Um, so, then, what are you planning to do by January 20th? <laughs> well, it's kind of hard to do a lot of things with no money. <laughs> we have a $13,000 overtime budget and a ONM &M budget of $32,000 for fuel and operating expenses. That's the entire flood control budget. Do you have the permits yeah. necessary to do the work? Do we have the permits? We are working on right now that City Council uh, reappropriated some money for storm systems this past year where we had $250,000. We're working on focusing on the Mill River maintenance and we got a project going out to bid relatively short order to the maintenance work on it. But we haven't found money for the Connecticut River yet. But what's the due date on the Connecticut River? That's January 2014. Oh, it is 2014. Yep. Now, let me caveat that. If he's showing active design and improvements to move forward, we might slip it a little bit couple to weeks. the right. Well, a couple uh, weeks. It, it, it keep in mind the, the rating. <laughs> well, I understand that he may need to go to bonding and get yeah. overrides and stuff like that. I, I'm not. I'm not this monster that lives up in the federal government that says. We have, a, we have an estimate of 1.2 million dollars to do engineering studies and the core basic maintenance. That's the estimate. 
Well, so, so my question is bring it back to bring it back to the standard. With the no, that's just, that's just the study. The well, study work we've done, and there could well. be future construction work coming out of that. But my question is, is um, some of the stuff seems as if it could be done relatively easily. Perhaps I misunderstand, but some of the vegetation could be removed or pushed back at least from the dike. We move, we mow the vegetation twice a year along the dike system. What they're looking for is the 15 feet at the toe, and we need to have a contractor come in and do that work. So that's what we're hoping to be doing some. Nobody needs anything else from the presentation. Right. Before the electrical is coming. That's coming. Yeah, it's yeah. 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 storm. Yep. What do you use, and what have you found to be most effective for herbicides? Typically, uh, even at the core, we don't spray our own. We have people that we pay people to do it because the licensing and all that stuff nowadays it, it becomes too rigorous to keep up the licensing and stuff. I don't know if Ned has people on staff that do have a license to spray. I don't know. Um, I know we don't. We contract it out. Roundup. Um, there's other stuff. I found something that can kill not. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, it's actually. So it's systemic. Wait, you're worried. I'm trying to think of what it's used for. I don't remember what it's called. Yeah, and you'll be getting some from me on the CDM probably by the weekend. Okay. I really just want to say something because people keep popping.